You're listening to The Support Report with Be Present, where we share real stories from young adults and how support changed their lives. Hey, thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Support Report, BRP Present. I'm Justin Peters, and joined by always, Kiara Riga. Kiara, how are you? I'm not bad. How's it going, Justin? I'm doing great. We both kind of uh, chatted before we pressed record here. We're feeling a little tired, but we got a lot of good things in the mix right now, so it's hard to complain about life. Yeah, agreed. I uh I'm just coming off some crazy trouble. It sounds like Justin's got a little bit left left in him, but yep. yeah, all good things. Um I just got back from speaking at Adobe Summit and going to Death Valley with my fiance and two of my best friends that like I hardly get to see. So um definitely feeling like emotionally rejuvenated, but exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> totally fair. Um, so today I was actually reading an article. It just piqued my interest. Um, the headline caught caught me. And I, I actually kind of wanted to bring it up into this conversation because I'm interested to get your take on a couple of these points. And the blog was 10 things not to say to cancer patients. And we can link it in the show notes. And I know we've talked about at least half of these on the podcast as as things like the very first one is say nothing. And we already know that's that's bad. But I wanted to know if I could run a couple of these by you and see what your take is if you think this is something that you shouldn't say. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, okay. The second one they say is how long do you have to live? Do you feel like this is insulting question, something not to ask? <laughs> Don't like, unless someone is talking about their life expectancy to you directly, you don't bring it up. Like it's the undertone of every cancer conversation. You don't need to slap people in the face with it. <laughs> totally fair. I figured that was the case on that one. <laughs> Uh, the second one is how can I help? And I know we've chatted about this one too. Maybe that's not the right question. I don't think it's the wrong question, but they even, uh, gave a suggested one in here and that's what day can I come over? I'm bringing this to you or blank to you, kind of making an offer or putting a few things out there that could potentially help. Do you feel like that's aligned with, with your train of thought too? Pretty much. I think how can I help is like, okay. But if someone says, oh, I'm all good, um, keep pressing. Right. And offer a few things. I actually don't love the, like, I'm coming over, tell me a day because sometimes like I can think a day is going to be fine. And then I'm not feeling well, or just don't want to be around people or whatever. And so I love when people will give like, Hey, I w I'm at the store. I would love to a pick something up for you and drop it off. And I'll text you when it's there. So you don't have to see me or B, I can come get your kids on my way and um, take them out of your hair for an hour. Or C, you know, um, I can pick up ingredients and come cook you dinner and we can hang out. Like give options with their like comfort level in mind because sometimes like I don't, like I always want to see my fiance, but like sometimes I'm like, I don't even want you to see me looking like this. <laughs> Never mind like friends, right? So um. I think always giving options and like letting people be okay with, you know, like letting people not want to see you and not taking that personally, I think <laughs> yeah. it's important. I think that's fair. <laughs> I think that's totally fair. I got one more for you. And I'm mm -hmm. really interested on, on this one. They say, don't say you're, you are strong or you are brave. And um, while you think about that, their rephrase that they say is, I'm sorry this happened to you, but I'm here to help you be strong. I don't know what you think about that one. Um, kind of both the the don't say you are strong, you are brave and, and kind of the reframe on that. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that this is one size fits all. I think most AYAs that I've spoken to don't like being called like strong or brave because we don't have a choice. Like the other option is death. Mm. I think the other, like their alternative the I'm sorry that this happened to you and I'm here for you are great. I'm here to help you be strong is not. Sometimes we don't want to be. And if you're putting that kind of stress on someone, like I definitely at the start was kind of like the super survivor, right? And like not showing any, um, you know, signs or issues. And then people started referring to me as that. And then I felt like I could never fall apart. And uh, so I think putting any pressure on someone to be strong or that strength needs to be any part of their experience only does them a disservice. And I think it's more important to focus on like, I'm here for you if 
like period. It doesn't need to be to help you be strong. I want someone who can be a listening ear when I need that, who can help me be strong when I need that. But like just overall, it, it, you know, let me kind of dictate how I'm going to react and it's going to be different every day. Totally fair. Totally fair. Well, thanks for playing along. Like I said, we'll drop that one in the show notes. There are a couple other cringy ones in here. Like I'm sure you'll be fine or everything happens for a reason. <laughs> we don't, I didn't even bring those up, but we don't need to get into those, but, uh, Kiara, this is, a. Uh, Another great interview uh, coming up here. Super excited about who we have in store for today. Do you mind a quick introduction and bringing the guest in? All right. So joining us today is Harjeet. Um, after immigrating from Can India to Canada in 2018, Harjeet was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma. Harjeet, welcome to the podcast. We're so excited to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you, uh, Justin. Um, I'm glad to be here. And I'm happy to talk about my journey. Yeah, why don't we get started with that? Do you want to give us kind of the uh, no cancer journey is brief, but kind of the synopsis yeah. of, of what you went through? Uh, so, yes, I did uh, migrated to Canada in 2018. Uh, like every immigrants have this, you know, dream of moving to a new country, having a new life, having a new career and having a family but everything was going smooth my husband and uh, we were working and all of a sudden I started having these symptoms which was just high fever and uh, we went to see our family doctor so in Canada things are a little different so you see our family doctor and they suggest you the medications and this process works like that so she said that, you know, it's just a viral or a fever. You just go home, take rest. Everything would be fine. Take Tylenol and things would be fine. So the episode of fevers were back to back. So weeks passed by. I still, ha I still had uh, high fevers, which was like 38 to 41 degrees Celsius. And uh, there was time when it went to 42 and my husband rushed me to emergency at night. And uh, I was literally having chills and we rushed to emergency. And uh, the emergency scenes are really kind of a shit show over here. So you just have to wait for like six to eight hours to get into uh, the uh, system. So we waited for six to eight hours and I was took in and they took my blood work. They did everything. And they said, it just looked like high viral, viral or a flu. You just go home. And next time, if you just have fevers, you don't have to come back. You just take Tylenol and things would be fine. And we went back home. And the fever episode lasted for two weeks, three weeks, and we were not getting any answers. So my husband got a little pissed off and he wanted to know what's going on because I could not go to work. I could not eat. I was having chills. And uh, we went to our family doctor and we spoke to her and she suggested that I should uh, reach, uh, she, ref she referred to infectious disease specialist who saw me and uh, there was same story again. He said that it looks like viral or a flu, we'll do some blood work. The blood work came fine and there was nothing uh, positive in that. And I was sent home saying that you should take Tylenol every two hours and make sure you write your fevers, you make a chart of your fevers. So you wouldn't believe I used to get fevers like every day around two o'clock and then four o'clock and then seven o'clock in the evening. And I used to take Tylenol back to back. I don't have any count of how much Tylenol I took. Mm. And one month passed by and uh, we were not getting any answers. We were really worried. And then I was finally like we pushed hard. We really advocated uh, to the infectious disease specialist. My husband said that we need answers. It's been a month. She's not able to eat. She's still getting fevers. We go to the emergency. We are sent back. And, you know, we wait there for hours and hours. And I was getting chills every 10 minutes. My body was getting chills every 10 minutes. And it was scary. And But because we were not getting any answers, it was most frustrating. And during that time, we reached out to our family doctor back home in India too. Just wanted to make sure, is there something else? And we made sure that we send all the blood work reports and everything to India too. And then finally, we pushed really hard to the system. And uh, my husband said, I'm taking her back to India if you're not getting any answers, because it's been more than a month. And uh, 
we don't have any answer. She's just taking Tylenol and cutting down the fevers. There might be something else. You can do a CT scan or MRI or X, Y, Z. But as Canadian system is, it's completely public health system. So you just don't get what you want. So it all depends on the medical team. If they feel that, you know, you want this, they'll get you done. So we fought really hard. And finally, they did my CT scan and uh, they found some kind of activity happening in my body. And uh, the doctors told us that she needs to get headbutted to the hospital ASAP. We'll do some other tests and scans and MRIs. And I was admitted in the hospital since then. And I was literally treated as a research patient. Honestly, I just had fevers, no other symptoms. And it started, I started having chills and fevers. And then it started with ulcers in my mouth where I could not eat anything. So I was admitted in hospital, University of Alberta Hospital in Edmonton. And fevers never stopped. It was ongoing. And when they found something on CT scan, they tried to do my laparoscopy to see if there is something inside my stomach or if there is something inside my body. It all came negative. Nothing, because they couldn't find anything. But the fevers were not stopping. So I had to be in hospital because of the fevers because it went up to 42 to 43 too sometimes. And uh, they started with my breast biopsy. They just asked some questions related to if I have some uh, family member who has cancer in my family and all. And they asked a couple of questions if I have any health, medical history or something like that. So based on those things, they tried everything. I was literally treated as a research patient. I had like laparoscopy, colonoscopy. I had surgery. I had biopsies. No answers. No answers at all. Two and a half months passed by. And we were so pissed. And we thought that, uh, my husband thought that he'd take me back to India. But it was so overwhelming for us. So my mom flew from India to Canada because her husband was working and while, while working, he has to took care of me too. Like I was in hospital, I could not go home because of my condition. And uh, we fought hard and we wanted to get answers. So we asked the doctors to get all the reports so I can send back to India so we can get some clarity on what's happening. And uh, finally, my uh, uncle who's back home, he said that uh, you guys should come back because you, you, your condition is really critical and we're not getting any answers. We don't know what's happening. So meanwhile, uh, my husband actually spoke to the team in hospital and they said, we really want to do one last biopsy. So before that, I had uh, breast biopsy, bone marrow biopsy, uh, all the surgeries and MRIs and scans, but all was benign. There was no nothing in the reports. And uh, they said that we really want to do one last biopsy, which is a skin biopsy, because we think that it might be an autoimmune disease or something, but we, we are not sure. So we just want to go ahead and do one skin biopsy. And I was not prepared for it. Honestly, it was two and a half months and I was so sick and I was not getting any answers. I was frustrated. I was all swollen up because I, I was on IV fluids completely and I was treated as a research patient. So many doctors used to come and see me and there was no answers. So we both were so, so pissed off with the health system and healthcare at that time that we really wanted to go home. And because I was getting chills and high fevers, there was they we had to plan how they can take me back to India because it's twenty to twenty four hours flight. So he went back to see my family doctor to ask her how we can carry her jeep to India because she gets chills every ten minutes and she's on high fevers. So taking her into a flight for a longer period would be you know difficult. So he went there and uh, we agreed for skin biopsy. On, on the side by side, because my uncle in India, he said that you should get the skin biopsy and this would be the last procedure and then you can come back home. So we, we said, okay, fine, let's do it. And during this whole period of time, it was almost August mid. August mid, it started in May end and it went up to August mid. And uh, he was with the family doctor and my mom was with me. My my brother, he was studying in BC and he moved to Edmonton and he was with me. And uh, the doctors just rushed into the room. We were just preparing all the discharge papers and everything. Like they were planning to discharge me. And uh, the doctors just rushed into the room. And she said, Harjit, we want you to stay. 
we don't want you to go back to India. We got the results. And I was, I was not sure what she going to say. And uh, I was like, what is it? She said, it's, um, it's a subcutaneous paniculitis T cell lymphoma. And honestly, I've never heard about these names before. And I was like, what is it? She's like, it's a stage four blood cancer. And uh, your condition is really critical. And we want you to stay here. We want you to start the treatment ASAP. And when she said those words that it's stage four cancer, I was completely numb. I was frozen completely. And my mom was next to me. And uh, by, he- by hearing those words that it's stage four cancer, I could see her eyes that, you know, she would just cry. And she. so I didn't want it to be emotional in front of her. And I said, okay, I need to talk to my husband and let him come back and we'll talk about it. I just said this and that's it. I couldn't say anything. I could not, you know, make, I could not say anything because my mom was standing in front of me. I felt like if I, literally, if I cried or if I bursted out, my mom will be, you know, just not be able to take it. And I was just 32 at that time. My, I just moved to new country to have my life and, you know, to enjoy my life. And I didn't expect it that life will take you turn on me like that. And I just called my husband and uh, I told him that uh, you have to come back. Uh, we've got the diagnosis. But I couldn't tell him on call that it's stage four. I just told him that we got the diagnosis. It's cancer. You need to come back. He just rushed back to the hospital. And honestly, we when we spoke to the doctor, we were not sure. Because until three months, they couldn't diagnose anything. And all of a sudden, when, you know, we were planning to go back to India, there were a lot of questions in, in our mind that why now? Like, you know, so we asked our team, like, if we have certain period of time so I can reach out to my family back home, my doctors, so just to check, like, you know, if the reports are fine, if the prognosis is right, there's no mistake on it. So the doctor said that, OK, fine, we can take four or five hours, but we need to start the treatment. We need to start the procedure and you don't have much time left so we need to start the chemotherapy tomorrow so we took that time it was six six hours or five hours we took that time we took all the reports we sent it back home to india we spoke to our family doctor back home Uh, my aunt who's in london uh, she's a doctor too so we spoke to each and everyone just wanted to make sure if it's a correct diagnosis and everybody said that you know it's it's stage four and your condition is critical we would say to get the treatment there, don't come back to India. Because by the time you'll come back to India, the process will start again and you might not have that time. So with all that, uh, obviously, we had, we, I didn't have any other choice to start the treatment. And I have never seen in my family anyone dealing with cancer and belonging to a South Asian community. My, my grandmother, my, my maternal side grandmother was diagnosed with cancer a long time back, but I was never told about it till the time I was 25. So, so, you know, the discussion of cancer was never happened. Like, you know, what I'm going to do, but it was like I was treated as a robot and we just started the treatment next day. So I was given a red devil chemotherapy, which is an aggressive and a rare kind of chemotherapy because my cancer was aggressive and the doctors mentioned that it's a rare type of cancer and the only globally there are only 150 to 180 cases reported because we don't have much study about it and my oncologist he said that you're my you're my first case so we will be trying our best to try certain uh, regimens and we'll see how it works because my cancer prognosis is still yet to come. So it was complicated by HLH and autoimmune disease. So along with my stage four cancer, it was um, complicated with HLH. So they started the chemo. The process was to give me every three weeks of chemo. So first three months of chemo was really harsh. It was really difficult for me to take in. Honestly, I could not react or say anything because I could see my family was going through a difficult time during you know this time and when I was alone in like washroom or somewhere I used to cry I used to cry and I used to take it all in because I didn't want it to make them feel that you know I'm not strong enough to take this and I didn't wanted them to lose that faith on you know 
whatever thing they say so three months passed by it was difficult i lost my hair i lost my eyebrows i felt like you know it, it was all very difficult for me to lose my long hair and stuff and after three months of chemo uh we were called in and uh, the oncologist room and he mentioned that i still remember his words he said that harjit what's your appetite and i was like what do you mean he's like i just want to know what's your appetite so i was like i want to live so i i remember this word i said i want to live he's like your chemotherapy is partially working on you and some of your cancer cells are so difficult and aggressive that they are not taking that chemo so i just have two choices for you one either we can continuously give your chemo i can try different regimens on you because it's a rare case so we we'll try different regimens and see how your body takes it secondly we can try a stem cell transplant in stem cell transplant we you might get a little life expectancy and it will have the side effects longer side effects but it will give you life longer and honestly i could not say anything in front of him and me and my husband we were just sitting and holding hands and we were just listening to it and inside my mind i was just thinking this is the end i mean i'm not going to make it and i think i'm not going to survive and i just we just went back home and uh, no one in my family talked about it what's going to happen and what what we are doing i just went into the room and i cried and i was like i don't know everything was just flowing in my mind that my life is over i'm just 32 and stuff like that and then finally my family discussed with my family doctor and they all discussed it that she has to go for a stem cell transplant i think that's better for her because we don't know what kind of chemos will be given and how her body will take it and i was still getting fevers so there was time i was still going to emergency i my chemos were delayed because of high fevers so that why the, my case was so difficult to manage from with my team so all things happen and we decided to go for a stem cell transplant and my oncologist mentioned that if i have a sibling they would like to um look for um, a stem cell donor and i mentioned that i have a younger brother and they did some testing on him and after a month we after two weeks or three weeks we got a call that he's a 100% match which is a rare because not every person gets a 100% match with their siblings how do you how do you have that conversation with your brother i'm guessing it was probably an easy one you just asked him if he would be open to this and he said yes or no, was it something so, different so that's that's the that's the thing in our community in our culture in our in my family we never talked about what's going on no one was ready to talk about cancer no one was having those conversation at my place they were ready to support me they used to prepare my meals they used to take me to hospital my mom flew my dad flew from india they were there completely with me but no one wanted to talk about it they were there to support me full and fledgedly but no one wanted to share like what they are feeling what i'm feeling what kind of pain i'm having through what kind of experience i'm going through it was all decision made like you know okay we're going to do this we're going to do this we're going to do this your brother is a stem cell donor he's going to be there and he was okay with that i remember because when they the doctors mentioned that we'll take some tests and do some tests on him he was ready he was ready he never said no to this obviously because i mean it's part in our indian families i would say asian families everybody is very you know supportive when it comes to someone's life that's always there right the helping and supporting kind of a thing so everybody agreed to it my uncle back home my aunt back home they all said that this is the right decision we should go for a stem cell my brother was a 100% match my oncologist was happy with this because he mentioned that it's really rare to find a 100% match and you are lucky to have a 100% match so they started the treatment uh to uh, for stem cell transplant but the pl- plan was to put me on a partial remission before stem cell transplant so the chemos were still going on and then all of a sudden i realized that uh, no one talked about to me for about fertility and i was not sure what's going on and i spoke to my oncologist about it and he said that I'm sorry but uh, we'll obviously refer you to the fertility specialist but I'm doubtful that you know 
you might have been into early menopause. So I went to the fertility specialist and we spoke about it. And she said that, I'm sorry, but you know, you've been thrown into early menopause. Not thrown. She didn't mention the word thrown, but I feel like I was thrown into early menopause yeah. at that age. And I was shocked again. I was like, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know what's going on next. If I'll survive this thing or not, if I'll, you know, beat this thing or not. I was every step, I was just doing what was told. I was treated, I was feeling like I'm a robot who is asked to do this, who is asked to do this, who is asked to do this. So months passed by and January 2020, uh, December 2020 was my last chemo for that year. And uh, I came home and uh, we celebrated Christmas with my family. And uh, Jan 2020, all of a sudden, I started having a blurriness in my right eye. And it was it was just after the Christmas, sorry. And the emergencies were not picking up the call. And my doctors were not picking up the call. And we had to rush to the emergency. So my husband rushed me to the emergency. And uh, they checked my vision. And they said that you have to see the ophthalmologist. The next morning, we saw the ophthalmologist. And he said, we think that lymphoma has gone to the eye. Mm. And then I had to go for the biopsy. And I was shocked again. I was like... I was just preparing myself for something else. And now I'm back to zero. And uh, they said, we need to do the biopsy. And once we get the biopsy, we'll let you know what's the next plan. And they did the biopsy. Luckily, it was negative. Uh, but it was CMV retinitis, which actually damaged my retina of my right eye due to the medications and the chemotherapy I was taking. So they had to inject my right eye every week to protect my left eye to stop that virus to go to my right eye, left eye. Along with that, I was going through all the chemos for my stem cell for a partial remission, which was every two weeks. So Jan and Feb was the toughest months for me. I mean, it was really tough for me to deal with everything. And I was not even prepared for my stem cell. I was just hoping that I just want to get over with this. I'm done with this. I was just losing that hope. Like, I don't know how will I survive? How will I do? I'm just doing it, but I don't know what will happen next. My life is completely a roller coaster ride during that whole six, seven months. And then February, the treatments were done. I was completely in partial remission. And March 2020, COVID happened. My stem cell was planned for March 2020, 15th or 16th of March. And we got a call from, uh, so I was uh, I was in a different city and the stem cell was supposed to be done in a different city, which was three hours drive because that's that has a stem cell transplant hospital. So we got a call from hospital saying that uh, uh, we will be uh, having some issues. Uh, so none of the family members could visit her during her stem cell transplant treatment. She needs to stay in hospital for 30, 35 days by herself. We'll be doing a chemo and radiation. You can only do a FaceTime or connect with the doctors, but no one can see her. And my whole family and we were like, just not sure what's going to happen now. I mean, how will I manage and do everything by myself during that period of stem cell where I was told that stem cell transplant is tough. You will be given seven days of chemos and radiation to kill your immune system. So the plan is, was to kill my immune system so that my brother's stem cell can be infused on me and then I can get his stem cell. So before getting his stem cell, my body needs to be completely my immune system needs to be completely killed. So the stem cell transplant was really tough and it was delayed from 17th March to 6th of April. So I had, because I had some cough and flu symptoms and they thought it might be COVID, but luckily it was influenza, it was not COVID. So I was admitted to the hospital on 6th of April, 2020. I still remember my family dropped me to the hospital and I hugged them and I felt that this is the last time I'm seeing them. I don't think so. I'm coming back from here because at that time I was just listening to all the stories globally. Everything was shutting down. It was global pandemic. People were just, you know, dying of COVID and so many things were going on worldwide. And I felt like during this time, my treatment 
along with COVID would might, you know, not be easy. And I just hugged them and I felt that this is the last time I'm seeing them. And I just went in and I was admitted for 35 days in hospital, dealing with stem cell transplant, chemotherapy, radiation. Honestly, every day I was just hoping and praying to see my family get up and, you know, just be back and hug them and just wanted to be there for them. Every day was really challenging for me. I was just hoping and praying to live for the next day. And I honestly don't know that 35 days of challenge, how how I did it. I never thought that I had that kind of strength or courage or, you know, that thing that I can come out of it. I somehow made it. 14th of April 2020 is my rebirth. That's what the medical team says. 14th of April, I was given my brother's stem cell and 100 days of stem cells are stem cell transplant are really challenging. So we were told that after stem cell transplant, she needs to stay near to the hospital in its vicinity so that if there is something, we can quickly treat her. So my whole family moved to that city for three months and they took care of me. It was COVID. My husband lost his job. My brother lost his job. My mom, dad were here. So everybody was there to support me. And during those 35 days when I was in hospital, that's how I started writing my journey. I started writing my blog. I thought that if I will not be able to make it from here, at least my story is being heard from, with, from my story is being heard by my family, my experience, my pain, my cancer journey, how I felt during this whole process. So that's how the blog started. But it took me a long time. 2020 to December 2020, I was completely bedridden. I was like a baby. My mom used to take care of me. I could not eat. I could not sleep. I could not take shower. I could not change clothes. I couldn't do anything. I could not walk. It was really difficult for me and my family to overcome those two years. I mean, because of COVID, things were difficult. I was so immunocompromised that I could not get COVID at all. So we just, you know, stayed at home. We didn't go out. We didn't let anyone in. It was it was just, you know, we four staying at home, not going out, just taking care of me. And I'm thankful and grateful that, you know, I had that biggest support, my family, my close friends who used to come and see me in the hospital, you know, who's to just take care of me. But one thing which always lacked in this whole process was the communication between us about cancer. And I think that's the taboo and a stigma, which I realized later. And since 2021, and I started sharing my story out. I started posting my story out in social media. I started posting my pictures, bald pictures. And my mom didn't like it first of all, because she was not happy if I, you know, I'm posting all these pictures like that. And, but I thought that it's important. It's important to talk about your journey. It's important to show your journey because there are people out there who need to listen to your story and they might get that help and support from your story. And I advocated for my health too, because being young adult, three months of uh, three months to diagnose and thrown into menopause, not knowing what's going to happen. So many things happened during that time led to advocacy and I participated and I joined a lot of communities. I joined a lot of support groups. There are, I don't know if you know, YAC and Canadian Cancer Society, Lymphoma Leukemia Society of Canada. So I've joined those groups. I am part of those groups now. I volunteer for them. I, I'm an ambassador for LLSC. I was uh, but I was with Yak too. So I just wanted to join those groups to feel that I could have a space with my own people, with people who have suffered from cancer, with people who actually understand what I'm going through. So that's how my journey actually started off advocating, sharing my story, being a speaker, talking about it more, and especially being in South Asian because not I could not see anyone with my color in those support groups. 
and i felt that that's not possible cancer doesn't discriminate you know cancer doesn't see what religion what caste what color you are and that's not right that it's just me who is going through all this so i mean it's been 4 years now it will be 4 years in april and i'm blessed and i'm grateful to be you know here and getting this second chance in life which not everyone gets it i mean i was lucky to have my brother as a stem cell donor who gave me this life honestly and my family uh who was there from head to toe just to support me and yeah i mean that's about it that's a lot you've been through a lot and thank you for being so open to share that um i would really love to talk a little bit more about you know being south asian and how like has your family been able to talk about this now that it's been more time what was it like for you not being able to talk about this with your family like i this is something i hear so often and i had a a degree of it but nothing to to anywhere near what you dealt with and i would love to hear your experience with that as i mentioned when i was told that i have cancer no one actually talked about it at home like they were all just you know get the treatment get the things get get everything done and just you know it will be back to normal but it doesn't come back to normal your life is never normal after cancer it took them a lot of while when i actually bursted out on social media with my story and with my bold pictures then my mom actually didn't like it and i told her that you know i have gone through so much and no one in the family talked about it i mean it's been almost one and a half year and i'm thankful and i'm blessed that you guys were there with me but it killed me inside like it completely changed me on my life i'm not the same person who i was before cancer and life has completely changed for me so i really need to talk i really need to understand and if you don't if you guys don't listen to me and if you guys don't feel that there's important to talk then how would i be able to make other people understand this if my family is not able to understand this then how i am supposed to make other people understand this so it took them a lot of time and one thing i missed when i was getting my chemos because i had long hair because i i belong to a sick community i didn't cut my hair i didn't uh, shave my head because my dad my mom uh were there and i i knew that they couldn't see me like that but finally when my oncologist said that she needs to shave her head because it was all like you know tangled and it was painful finally my husband shaved my head along with his head he shaved his head he shaved my head just to show that support but after that i was always told to cover my head whenever i used to talk to my family back home mm. just that you know that thing that i can't just embrace that thing and i had to cover it for a long period because my family didn't like it so all those factors came to me when i was alone at stem cell transplant where i really wanted to write about all these things because i thought that if i'm gone i want them to listen what i was going through how painful it was mentally physically financially socially it was all i was completely shut from my social media too i didn't spoke to anyone i didn't tell anyone the, the worst part was telling anyone that you had cancer so my husband was the one who spoke to our close friends who spoke to my family who spoke to my family back home like you know like he he was the one who spoke to everyone he was amazing caregiver he's been amazing caregiver until now and i feel that the conversation conversation between us is also lacking and that's also one of the challenging things that caregivers don't talk right so yeah. that's also one of the things where we feel that caregivers never express cancer patients and survivors might express but caregivers never express so it was challenging south asian community it's a big stigma and taboo i went to india back home after 5 years of my treatment cancer covid no one talked to me about it hmm. oh you look better now you look good you know something like that but no one actually asked me or talked to me about cancer and i felt that that it needs to be heard 
that's how wherever i have been going through now with the cancer conferences or as a speaker i have i've talked about it a lot and finally i started a page a private group page for with a friend because i used to get a lot of dms when i used to post my story from asian women that uh, you know it's pleasure to see your story and i'm so inspired i'm so motivated but i can't even share my story with my family i can't i just need i was told that once your treatment is done just move on so imagine what that patient or that person is going through that's how this page got started so it's called chai and hope uh, south asian cancer community it's just a private group it's a small group because i know it, it's not easy for south asian women to talk about it publicly because of their families husbands whatever it is right so we started this page which is private where they can where they don't feel left out they don't feel that they are alone in this journey there are groups out there there are same color people out there who who've got through the who've gone through this and who are there to support and help and talk so it's a big taboo and i don't know how long will it take to break this so yeah and what about your instagram page as well it seems like you're pretty active there now and publicly posting i was private well. before yeah i was private before so before uh, cancer i remember it was a private page and uh, then i started writing when i saw, it was 2021 i guess when i actively participated again back to my instagram and i first post was my cancer story and with my bald head bald pictures and my complete story and a lot of people commented shared and talked because a lot of people didn't knew in my friend circle that i had gone through this because i was quiet for a year and then i finally made it public because i thought that why don't i just talk about it more and because after that post i got few people dms who were actually diagnosed and they didn't know how to talk to their family how to take all this cancer thing because in asian culture in south asian culture cancer is the end they think that cancer is the end there's no coming back from cancer or cancer is a is a death sentence yeah. they feel that some some asian families they feel it's a karma too it's a bad karma so all those factors then i felt that people were messaging me and i felt that you know it's right time to talk it's right time to advocate and to make a difference to support those who need it no one has to go through this treatment alone and no one should go through this treatment alone i feel like so that's how i just actively participate i just actively went on on instagram sharing my stories collaborating with other organizations supporting other organizations i've participated with numerous number of uh, communities grow support groups in canada and us and since i was in india i actually connected with a lot of people in india too because i really wanted to spread awareness and make that difference that's awesome mm-hmm. well we'll definitely share out your your um instagram page also your linkedin or your um link tree has a ton of resources all yeah. kind of summarized so we'll put those in the show notes for anybody mm-hmm. that's interested in connecting with you further but we'd love to to ask you one final question if you'd be up for it and that what that is what is great support look look like to you um it sounds like a lot of this conversation has been around changing the stigma but um thinking through anyone that that truly was a great supporter throughout your journey um let it be your husband maybe your brother or someone like that can you encapsulate in a couple of words what that really means to you and for for great support i think i was grateful to have my family around me like my brother my parents who flew yeah. from india my my husband my close friends and not everyone gets that support mm-hmm. i've seen people who go through uh treatments alone i have myself seen when i used to go for a chemo i have seen people sitting there and getting chemo and there's no one they are driving themselves so so a lot of these factors and i feel that when you're going through uh cancer you need to ask for help i mean there's no shame in asking help and like if you have friends and family for them too like if you feel that your loved one is going through cancer you should offer help and support to them too and and there are support groups and communities i came across a lot of groups who are actually 
uh, help cancer patients going through chemo, providing them food and stuff like that. So, you know, there are tons of support groups. There are help out there. It's just you need to just look for it. And it's very difficult for a patient who is going through cancer to look for a to look for all those things, right? But I'm sure that, you know, all the hospitals, like in over here in Canada, uh, which hospital I was admitted to, there was a nurse who actually connected me to Young Adult Cancer Canada. Awesome. When I was going through my chemo, she said that I, because I just asked her a question. I said, I can't find anyone young like me in this uh, room she's like no no there are a lot of people and i think you should connect to this group it's really a gr- strong group and it's a strong community of young adults dealing with cancer so all those groups are there it's just that you need to have the right person to guide you that's awesome well thank you so much for sharing your story on the support report today it's been a pleasure looking forward to continuing to to follow you and, and get to know you even more so thanks for thanks for the time Thank you. Thanks a lot.